Hey everybody, welcome to The Mountain Gamer. Today we're taking a look at a solo variant for Empires of the Void 2. Now, if you've never played Empires of the Void 2, um, but first of all, don't mind Empires of the Void 1. It's a totally different game. You don't need to play it before you play this one. It's two separate beasts. It's sort of a remake of the first one. Basically, designer Ryan Lockett um, just decided to, you know, play around with the general idea again, just make a whole new game. Anyway, so in parts of the, of the Void 2, uh, you know, you're moving a spaceship across this big map, uh, discovering new planets, uh, picking up goods and resources and building a little tech tree and having little adventures and stuff like that, maybe getting to a fight with, uh, with someone else around the table and stuff like that. It's a pretty good game, a very sprawling, very beautiful, uh, very beautiful game, like pretty much all of Ryan Lockett's uh, games. If you don't know who Ryan is, uh, he owns Red Raven Games, he designs his own games, does most of the artwork for all of his games, and self-publishes as well. So yeah, kudos to him. His most recent game uh, right now is Sleeping Gods. Um, I'm still waiting on my retail version. It was supposed to come out in September, it's now mid-October, so yeah, keeping my fingers crossed for that. And then he's got something else coming out coming out in February 2022 called... Uh, no, not near and far. Now or never. Yeah, now or never. So yeah, 2022 February. Look for that. But anyway, I, I, I digress. So in part of, of The Void 2, um, I was looking for a solo mode because the first time I played it, I tried sort of like teaching it to myself by playing like the two player situation, like, you know, playing, trying to do those two roles. And I found it kind of hard to do that. And I thought to myself, there's got to be a way to play this solo. So I went on the BGG and I found two, two or three variants and uh, reading them quickly, I basically latched onto the one that seemed simplest in the way that there's just not that much uh, upkeep on the AI's part, right? And uh, this one is called uh, The Perilous Fringe and it is by Vilith or Vector Dream, a user on BGG. Now I tried this out, I liked it. That being said, being who I am, um, I tweaked it a little bit, like five, 10%. Nothing major. I just, you know, made the, the, the edges a bit squarer, if that's a thing. And I made the thing just more uh, palatable because the, it was just like a whole bunch of, you know, just like papers and papers and papers and sheets. And I was like, let's make it into the little cards that you can put on top of the board. Just, just a more digestible format. That being said, I'm not taking anything away from the person who designed this solo variant. It works nicely. And uh, it's also a good way to learn how to play the game. So if you've never played this thing, maybe try out this, this, this solo variant because what you will be doing is the same thing that you would be doing in a multiplayer game. So whatever hiccups you run into during that first play, you know, just look, look, look up the rules, keep playing, and that's it. And when it comes to the AI's turn, it's pretty simple. It's just, you know, go through a checklist of things and that's it, it's very quick. So all that being said, uh, we should jump into it right now because the video is much too long. That's just, I just go into it, I think a little bit too deep. So maybe skip ahead if you want, that's, you know, whatever. So there you go. Now, if you're more of a person who wants to learn by watching it played, well then, uh, I made another video that should be up now of me playing this thing with this solo variant. So full game solo with those rules. And that's it, yeah. And so, uh, yeah, it's pretty exciting. So there you have it. Let's get into it right now. The explanation for a solo variant for Empires of the Void 2. Let's do it. <laughs> All right, so I am in the process of setting up a game now. As you see, I'm already down to, I don't know, step three or four, okay? So I've taken out a planet already. I've put uh, the planets out randomly. I've even taken the time to uh, put out the Sorkin Regency randomly see here. So as I said, you set up this whole board, you know, for the first few steps anyway, just like a two-player game. Now, once you get to step four, you're going to do something a little bit uh, different here. What you're going to do is you'll go get, let's say, your five event cards for the planets that you will be using. In this particular case, Corzar, Celast, Measle 3, Sentina, and uh, Corlazon. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, I've got those. And you'll just shuffle that. And then as per the instructions, you will uh, draw them in a certain order. Okay, so let's go Measle. And the, can you see that? Yeah, okay, so Measle, Corzar. Sentina, Corlozon, and Silas. Oh, I just knocked into the camera, sorry about that. So as per the instructions here, what you're gonna do is on the first planet, so Measle 3, you will put three influence. Because again, the whole deal with this, this uh, way to play basically is that the, the AI you'll be playing against already has a presence like in, in the space over here, right? So on Measle 3, they will have three influence. So we'll put that there. 
Now I could rewind and rewind a little bit and tell you that in step four, what you're gonna do is you'll just go get a color of your choice for the AI. In my case, I've taken red, so you'll get the ship, uh, you know, the cubes and the cylinders here, as well as uh, all of his units. So star sloops and star farers, and you'll get his uh, four bases, okay? You will not be needing the, um, the academies or the other types of buildings there, just the four bases, the, 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 the color cubes and the ship, okay? So you'll put that aside in a little area, you'll call that, let's say, the AI's reserve. So that being said, let's continue here. So with the second card, which you'll do, actually the second and the third card, you will put two influence. So in this particular case, uh, that would be Cor Corzar and Centina. So Corzar is way at the bottom here, so I'll put two influence here. There you go. I'm sorry, I can't really fit the whole board on this thing. The camera would have to be, have to be like five feet high in the air. And two on Centina. That being said, once we play and everything, I will be moving the camera. All right, then it says on the fourth card, so one, two, three, four, Corlozan, you'd put one influence and actually one control. So Corlozan, one influence and one control. And lastly, on the fifth card, it's just one control. And that would be Celeste, which is uh, down here. Okay, so that was step four. And now, actually, I've kind of skipped ahead here, but I mean, it doesn't matter in which order you do this, but uh, before placing the influence on the control on these on these bigger uh, inhabited planets, you still have to put um, AI control cubes on three Sarkeen free uh, uninhabited planets. So these small ones here. So we've got what? One, two, three, four, five. Yeah, there's five that are Sarkeen free. So you could just roll a die to, uh, to figure out, you know, where to put it. So let's just roll a D6 here and just start counting from the top. All right, so six. Let's go one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, then we'll start counting from that one. Two, so one, two, put it here. And then, uh, I don't know, let's start counting from here. One, okay, <laughs> easy enough. All right, so again, doesn't really matter in which order you do this, but now this has established, you know, what kind of presence uh, the AI has in this particular space, or uh, the void, as they call it. Next, you'll move on to uh, step five, and that's all about placing these explore tokens. So you, uh, you know, do this regularly, okay, J just like you would do in a regular game. But when you place them on an AI controlled world, you flip it face up right away. So you know what's there, okay? Now the rules say, and now when I say the rules, I'm always talking about my version of the rules, okay? If you wanna look up the other guy's uh, version, uh, feel free to do that. But um, in my rules, the AI will never benefit from anything on these tokens, okay? You know, like in this particular case, it says plus two victory points. I mean, the AI doesn't really, he will score a little bit of victory points every once in a while, but for the most part, he won't. So this will not affect him in the same sense that if ever the AI moves down here and flips this over and it says, uh, I don't know, it, it probably won't say that, but let's say it says gain a good or whatever, he will not, okay? He will not be affected by pretty much anything on the board, okay? But we'll get into that later. Then in step six, it's all about the, the, goods. the goods. Now you will do this pretty much like in the rule book, okay? So if anything uh, is in orbit here, it's face down. And if it's on the surface, it's uh, face up. And same thing with um, a planet that the AI does control, okay? So it's gonna be face down here and face up over here. Now you might be thinking, yeah, but they control that planet. Don't they get that good? They don't, okay? They don't right now. If ever their, their ship comes back and they win a, pl uh, a battle or something, then they will pick it up, okay? But for now, they, they don't. It just it stays on the board, just like that. The only major difference with this step is that if you, uh, you know, when you, when you put a good on a, a small uninhabited planet where the AI does control, you will put it face up, okay? That's the only difference. But for the rest, um, you know, just do it the same as you usually would. So this here would go face down. This down here is controlled by the red player, so it's gonna be face up. This would be in orbit face down. This would be face up. We can't go there. This is done, this is done. This is face down and this is face up. We got Corzar as well. So face down and face up. Okay, so that was step six, all about the uh, goods tokens. Steps seven and eight is all about, you know, preparing your own player board and everything. So again, you you will be playing the same way as you always do, okay? So I've picked green, so I've got the seventh academy of the Ich. So I've got my buildings and all my stuff. I got my cubes and all that. Step nine is gonna be the same as the rule book. So you're, you're you know, playing a two player game. So you'll get this extra little thing here for your command points. 
Step 10 is about your starting income. Now, in this particular solo mode, you will get uh, 10 credits instead of seven. All right, so let's just throw this on here for now. This is an absolute mess. I know I'm gonna fix this afterwards. Now, I didn't mention this before, and it does say in the instructions, so that's my bad. Um, in the first few steps, I think it's like step uh, three, Usually, in a two-player game, you put some credits on the action spaces way up top. You will not be doing that in the solo mode. Next, in step 11, you'll be putting your uh, marker here on zero victory points, and you will actually be putting the AI on a predetermined number. Now, if you want to play easy-ish, right? Or easy, actually, you'll put him on 40, because the whole concept of this thing is the AI starts with a high number of victory points, and you are trying to beat that. If you manage to beat that, you know, at the end of the game, well, then you win. Now, in your first game, you might put it at 40 or 45 or whatever, and if you get really good, well, then, then just bump it up, you know, 50, 55 or whatever. That's how you win the game, is by beating that particular score. And the little tweaks that I brought to this version of the solo mode is that the AI might score a little bit of points. Okay, because every once in a while, like when, when you go when you go through that checklist of you know how will he react to a certain action, if ever he can't do it, it'll say, well, the AI scores one VP immediately, right? That's the only time that the AI will score points in game. So for now, uh, let's put him on forty. Okay, I'm gonna play a game and I'll try uh, I'll try to reach forty. So way down here, we'll put two reds here to indicate that he's got forty, and we'll put a third one way up top because as I said, he might make a little more points. Next, it's all about the allies, uh, steps 12 and 13. You will look at the planets where the AI has some influence. So in this case, Sentina, Measle, Corozan, and Corzar. And you will take those allies. Okay, so everything that has to do with the allies. So Cor Corzar here, as well as the tokens. I'll take them out of the bags eventually. But you'll take all of these and you will put them with the AI's reserve. Now, the AI will not benefit from any of the allies' um, effects here, okay, at all. This is just to show that he now has these guys as allies. So if you want to go get, you know, these dudes, well, you'll have to go on Corzar and put more influence in the AI. And then this will come over back to you. So right now, he's got Corzar and Measle, and Corlozan, and Sentina. Wow, okay. So the only thing left for me to go get right now is Silast. So I'll put all of these in the AI's reserved area. In the next steps here, uh, steps 14 and 15, you know, once you've uh, shuffled all, all of the power cards and made your deck and everything, after dealing yourself three cards, you will just discard three cards, okay, to sort of, you know, simulate, simulate the AI drawing cards. Now, again, the AI will never, you know, draw cards per se. He'll never use cards, but um, he will kind of deplete the deck every once in a while. For example, if you go take the scavenge action, you know, to, to refresh everything, like refresh your hand and your command and all that, well, and the AI will respond by drawing, you know, discarding three cards off the top of this deck. So that'll just make the game go by a little bit faster and it simulates, you know, that second player refreshing um, every once in a while. All right, so I got one, two, three for me. And then let's discard one, two, three for the AI. So we'll put that in the discard pile. Once that is done, you will add your five event cards uh, into the deck and you'll shuffle everything again. And um, it does say in the rules, but this is like steps uh, 16 and 17, um, the AI will never benefit from any event card that shows up on the board, with the exception of cards that say, uh, this planet is now a wormhole connecting to somewhere else. You know, if, if that's the case, well, then the AI, upon moving there, if it's beneficial for him, he'll use that, okay? But all of the other event cards, you know, anything that says, like, while you control Corlozan, you have plus one battle to all your units or something, the AI will not use that. Why is that? Well, I don't like fiddly stuff. I don't want to have to remember, you know, all the boosts and the stuff that the AI has. I don't like that. If you like that, you can you can do it. If you flip an event card and you're like, yeah, the AI could use that, it makes sense. Well then, go for it, man. Track all of that stuff and have a blast. But for me, I wanna keep it simple. Now in steps uh, 16, 17, all that jazz, it's all about putting the score card in the middle of the deck. Now you should still be doing that, okay? Because even though when this thing shows up, okay, the AI will not score. Okay, only you actually score. You'll score twice in the game, like you usually do, but the AI will not score. Again, because he's got a, you know, a specific or a predetermined score, which will be boosted a little bit every once in a while, but as a, as a whole, as a main rule, he will not, you know, abide by the score card, nor will he abide by the last, um, 
the last scoring round of the game, okay? But you're gonna put the card in there because when it pops up, the card does tell you to activate your colonization card. <laughs> that was well pronounced. And you will still want to do this because it can give you, you know, you can pay credits to get an Empire card and stuff like that. So do keep that in the deck. Uh, next on step 18, you will give yourself a random resource. In my case, it's a uh, mushroom from space. And you will give a random good to the AI. So put this in his reserve, okay? Because the AI will use some of the goods. And that's one, um, one change that I brought to, to this thing. And it, it was kind of a, a complaint, if you will. It's that the AI doesn't do anything with all of the stuff he picks up, right? So whenever a ship, like if a ship ends its turn here, you'll have him pick up this, this good. And you'll see uh, at certain points in the game, whenever the AI has, the AI has three resources, uh, he'll be able to spend them to do some stuff. But let's not get bogged down. We'll get into it when we get to that. All right, step 19, uh, you don't need two of those, you just need one, okay? And you'll be using that to select your actions. And now step 20 is all about uh, choosing where you start, okay? Now, you can start, of course, on any space node. I'll decide, let's say, here for now, but it'll probably, probably won't be there. And as for the AI, I will have him start on the trade ship, okay? Now, you could roll a die and do this randomly, and the original rules had something or other. I'm like, you know, just right there, <laughs> okay? It's in the middle. It's kind of close and far to everything, so it'll be fine for now. So just plop him right there. The AI will also start with one star sloop and two starfarers on his controlled inhabited planet that is worth the most VPs, all right? So controlled inhabited planets. He's only got two. And this one is worth two, this one is worth two, so aha, they're the same. Well, then it says here, if tied, choose randomly. <laughs> okay, I uh, love me some randomly. So this is gonna be one, two, three, and four, five, six. One, two, three, cool. So all of this stuff will go onto Corlozan as protection. And lastly, you will put two starfarers on the AI's world ship, giving him a little bit of, uh, you know, attack and defense. Now, it does say in, in the rules down here, but uh, the AI will only ever get to move his world ship, okay? The star sloops will just never move. They won't, okay? Anytime it says move, you're going to move this big guy over here. Now, that being said, they, may, they might get pushed back, basically, okay? Like, they won't actively move, but if I go in there and I win, you know, they will have to be pushed back to the nearest uh, spot where they have some control tokens, okay? And that's basically it for setup. Again, pretty much a standard two-player setup, okay? The only big difference is there's a bit of starting influence, a bit of starting control, and some ships. Eh, you know, and some face-up tokens here and there. Nothing major. That's what I like about this thing. You don't have a million different things to think about when you're setting up. So with that done, um, then let's jump into, you know, how the AI will uh, react to all of the different actions. Now, you can print out this uh, handy-dandy guide here, okay, that I've printed on a, a small piece of paper. And this is good for your first play. Like, you can read through all these. Like, if it's moving attack, then you'll do all of this. It seems like a lot, but it's not. It's basically just checklist, and you'll get used to them. But if you, you know, once you know this stuff, then you can print out these smaller things here, you know, so this is just for the move, this is just for recruit. Now I've actually uh, made them so they sort of fit right onto here, right? So, you know, you know, by the by, by this time you already know that this is move and attack, right? Now the problem with move and attack, okay, let me just put the other ones here, like this is going to be uh, research and build, right? Now the problem with move and attack is the rules are sort of long for when you move and when you attack, so I've done it like this, so you could do, let's say, here, okay? So it's move, and then it's more of an attack situation. But again, you can put these anywhere on the table if you don't like this. I've made an attack version that stands up also if ever you want to, I don't know where you want to put it, but there you go. So this is going to be card action or diplomacy, and recruit, and then of course uh, scavenge. I didn't print out anything because the only thing that's going to happen when you go on scavenge is that the AI is going to discard uh, two cards from the power deck. I might have said three in the beginning, but it's two. But if you want to put it at three, you can do it also. It doesn't really matter. So yeah, there you go. So that's the setup. So with all that, we're pretty much ready to go. Right, let's put that over here, actually. That way it doesn't hide the wormhole. So let's go through how the AI will react whenever you take a spe specific action, right? Again, what I really love about, about this thing is that you're going to play the exact same way, well, pretty much the exact, the exact same way as you would um, when playing against a real player. I mean, your strategies might change, but, you know, your actions stay the same. There's nothing funky that you'll be doing that you usually would not be doing. So let's start with uh, the first one, right? So move and attack. So if you pick move and attack, 
Um, you do what you need to do, so you'll move and then you'll attack. Uh, uh, it says so in the title. And then the AI will respond. So first, it will move. Now, I'll put this on the screen. It's a whole checklist. So he will try to move in the preferred order of uh, your least defended inhabited planet. If that doesn't work, he'll go to your least defended uninhabited planet. If that doesn't work, he'll go towards the closest Sarkeen free non controlled inhabited planet. <laughs> okay. So Sarkeen free non controlled inhabited. In this particular case, it'd be right here, right? Because it's not controlled and there's no Sarkeen on it. Um, by the way, con con uh, concerning the Sarkeen, it does say so in the rules, but um, the AI and, and the Sarkeen are buddies, right? So it's uh, plausible for the AI to like end his turn right here, okay? They, they will not start a fight with the Sarkeen. They can do that, you can't. If you stop here, you're gonna have to fight the Sarkeen, okay? So let's keep going here. Um, then it says, tour the player's world ship. Okay, this is always like, if one doesn't work, go to two. If it doesn't work, go to three. If it doesn't work, go to four, yada, 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 right? And when they say towards the least defended uh, planet, that means where you have the least total attack force. Dice are not taken into account, okay? So you'll look at the, you know, the little explosion here logo, this is attack force. So whatever is strongest, they will go there. And of course, if there is ever a tiebreaker here, you'll choose, let's say, closest distance. And if it's still tied, choose randomly. This is, you're, you're gonna see that a lot. Like the last, you know, the, the last if this doesn't work is always gonna be choose randomly. Now, how does the AI ship actually move? So special rules at the bottom here. So the world ship has a move speed of one space, okay? So if it says move towards yada yada yada, well then, let's say he wants to move towards here, it would take him two, right? Well, he's gonna move of one, tough noogies. Now, when we get to uh, the scoring uh, round, like the mid-game scoring, he's gonna be bumped up to a move of two, okay? Every time he moves. So again, the AI doesn't spend command points, none of that, he has no you know player dashboard or anything. You're just gonna follow the rules that are printed on the card. Next here it says, yeah, he'll be upgraded to two moves after mid-game scoring. Uh, the AI will ignore hazards completely, okay? It's like he's got the, uh, what is it there? The cloaking technology, right? So he'll just move through hazards like, like they were butter, okay? Uh, he does not pick up or drop off units. That's very important. He will not, you know, he'll he'll move with, with his guys, but he cannot drop them off, he cannot pick them up. So that's moving. Now we'll continue on with an attack, okay? So attack, I've put this with when the AI ends his movement, because that's usually when you attack. But there's also some times where you won't attack, but you're ending your movement. I uh, honestly, if you want to reformat this, go ahead. I just, I had to fit this on little cards. So there we go. <laughs> so when the AI ends his movement, he will seize control of planets if possible. Okay, so you know, if he ends his movement here, well, of course he'll put a cube there, of course. Now again, if he puts a cube there, you do not give him a victory point, okay? Never give the AI any victory points unless it says so on one of these cards. For now, it doesn't say that, just don't do that. Just put a red cube here, you're done. Um, then we go here, when AI ends movement, on a Sarkin free inhabited planet, the AI will always stop on the surface and he will trigger battles uh, with players or inhabitants, okay? So that means that if this guy ends his movement on, on Measle as a whole, you will always send him down here. Now this would be a dumb move for him because he would essentially, you know, start a battle with, with these dudes and upon starting a battle, he will lose his influence and losing the ally token. So that's gonna go back in the supply. And then he'll put a control marker here, okay? I know, it's weird. The AI acts like a dumb dude sometimes, okay? That's just the way it is. So the AI does follow the rule of if you attack a planet on which you had some influence, you lose your ally, okay? That's important. But they will always try to go to the surface to kick some butt. And the reason for that is, you know, if, if this was your planet, he would want to take it away from you. Now here, it's a dumb move because he's losing his points. But if this had been, let's say my planet and he moves into here, by starting a battle, yes, he loses this, which doesn't really matter to him because he doesn't score points ever, right? But it's good for him because now he's taking this off, basically, you know, uh, stopping you from making three points later on in the game. So that's why he's doing that. If we continue here, it says there's a note here. It says AI picks up goods when stopping onto tokens or when gaining planet control. Okay, so if he has a fight here, he gains control of it, he'll pick up these two and you'll put this stuff in his supply. We'll talk about why later. If we continue here, it says uh, the AI also reveals explore tokens, you know, uh, but uh, he will never gain bonuses or effects from them. We've talked about this before. Okay, so let's go with special rules for battle. If the AI has more than three units in a battle, you will choose the AI's three's most powerful units. 
and if tied, choose randomly. Okay, this might happen that he'll have more than three units in a stack. We'll talk about that later. But if he does, you'll just take the strongest ones and you'll use those. And I've put powerful here in italics because that refers to the amount of attack power, not the amount of dice. That's how we're going to calculate things. Next, of course, it says the AI scores no VPs for winning battles. You know, that, that one VP that you always forget when you win a battle, <laughs> he won't score that. Next, it says upon losing the AI units retreat to the nearest region uh, that he controls, and if tied, go to the planet closest to the AI world ship, and if still tied, choose randomly. So, you know, so standard rules here. If he loses, he'll move back to the closest spot that he controls. Now, once you've, you know, taken, taken a, an action and the AI responds, well, you don't, you don't move that thing. I mean, the AI doesn't move that thing, right? So if you went to move an attack, and the AI responded with, with his thing, when it comes back to your turn, well, then you have to move this this uh, this token here to pick another action. If you want to redo move an attack, well, then you'll have to, you know, pay two commands to do that. And even when you do that, you don't move this, this token. That's how I understand it, even in a multiplayer game. Like if my friend uh, Daniel, okay, picked this, and then on my, um, on my follow action, I'm like, uh, no, I, I, I don't want to do that. I want to do a card action. So I'll pay two. I'll do card action, right? Then I become the first player. I have to move this, right? It's not because I paid for something on my follow that I move this thing. You only move this thing when you become the first player. So now, because in the solo mode, you're always the first player, uh, you always have to move this thing, okay? Paying here does not move the token. Does that make sense? I hope so. Tell me in the comments if I'm wrong. <laughs> Now, when you take the build and research action, the AI has to follow your exact action, okay? And what that means is, if you only did build, well, he will only do build. If you only did research, he'll only do research. If you did both, he'll do both, okay? Just to keep that in mind. It doesn't say on the little card here, but it, de it does say on uh, this thing here, the AI will follow your exact action, okay? So, on a build, the AI will automatically build a base respecting planet limits. So you'll grab a base from his uh, supply. Remember, he's got four. So you'll take a base from his uh, supply. Remember, he's got four. And you will build it, um, you know, by following this this checklist here. So number one, you'll try to build it on the, the AI's world ship, okay, on the mini itself. And this will give his world ship plus one die and plus one attack, you know, as, as bases do, basically. And it says here, note the AI's world ship building limit is one. So the most you can put onto here would be the one. Next, if that doesn't work, i.e. if you've already done that and you're later in the game, you'll go right down to number two here. So you'll try to build a building on the AI's uh, controlled inhabited planet with the least amount of his units on it. So look at his controlled planets and where he has the least defense you know, you'll put uh, one of these tokens. And if you're tied, choose the one with the highest VP. And if you're still tied, you go to number three just below where it says you will put the base on the AI controlled uninhabited planet with the least amount of units on it. Again, this is pretty straightforward stuff. Just read and it'll things should flow nicely. And then if all of that doesn't work, you know, i.e. he doesn't have any more bases or he has nowhere to put them, well then uh, the AI immediately gains one VP. So there you go. So then you would actually move his his scoring marker and he would gain a VP. So that's if he responds to your build. Now, if he responds to research, it says here the AI discards three random goods. Because remember, he does pick up goods. Okay, if he stops here, he'll pick that up. If he wins a battle here, he'll pick those up. So he will, you know, amass a small quantity of these tokens on his, you know, in his reserve. So when he does research, he will discard three of those random goods that he has in his reserve to immediately score one VP. There you go. And if he doesn't have any goods or if he doesn't have enough, he will gain one random good. So it's either he discards some to make a point or he gets one good back to later, you know, discard and make points. So there you go. So that's for build and research. When we get to card action or diplomacy, the AI will immediately, and we, you know, to, with no cost, he will place one influence on the Sarkin free inhabited planet where he currently has the least influence zero first, of course. So this, he just like succeeds at influence. So if there's a planet where he has none, boom, you'll put one on there. Easy as that. Or, you know, or if he has some everywhere, you'll just take the one that's the lowest and you'll put one there. There you go. If you're tied, you'll choose the planet with the uh, offering the most powerful allies. And that's of course, when we say power, it's always that uh, explosion logo here. If you're still tied, you'll choose the planet 
that offers the most expensive unit. So first you're going by, you know, the power of the ally. But then it's like, oh yeah, but there's two places where the power is one. Okay, well go with the most expensive to recruit. Okay, if you're tied. And if you're still tied, well, you'll choose randomly and you'll give the AI one VP. Now there's some notes at the bottom here. It says, um, if a card asks you to give a player one of your power cards, you'll discard it. Okay, Th that happens sometimes on, on a card action. It says, uh, give a player a card, blah, 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 just discard it. If we continue, it says, uh, if AI has more influence than you on a planet, put the ally card in the AI's reserve. Okay, this is standard stuff. If the AI wins some influence, he'll take the card from you and put it in his reserve. Again, we've talked about this. He will not gain any of the ally's abilities. He's just basically taking it off you to mess with you. And next here, we've got recruit. So uh, after you've done recruit, the AI will recruit one unit in the preferred order. So first he'll try for one of his starfarers. That doesn't work. He will recruit the most powerful ally, again, power value only, uh, from the allies uh, that he's able to recruit from, right? If you're tied, you'll pick the most expensive unit. And if you're still tied, go random. Then he'll try to recruit his star sloops. And it says here, when the AI recruits uh, his last star sloop, put it onto his world ship. Now at this point in the game, this would be pretty late, right? But as you see here, he's already got uh, one, two, three units on there. So yes, you will still put a fourth one because I mean, you can put like in the regular rules, you can put a stack as big as you want, right? But he's got four units on there now, okay? And it, if you continue to read here, it says, when the AI recruits the last star sloop, put it onto his world ship. And from now on, the world ship operates at plus one unit limit, okay? Now, you know, this happens, I believe one of the races has a technology that actually gives them plus one unit limit. So this is like if they unlocked that technology. So that makes it uh, a little bit stronger. And if all of this is not applicable, well, then the AI gains two VP. Haha, not one, two. Why? Because I felt like it. Haha. And then as far as unit placement, right? Now we've seen if he recruits the last star sloop, it goes on there. But what about, you know, if it wasn't that last Star Sloop, what if it was, I don't know, one of these uh, Mazron agents or whatever. Okay, so unit placement, it's gonna be on an AI controlled planet that also contains a building, you know, just like you do, in the preferred order. So he'll try to go to on the inhabited planet where he has the least amount of units. And if you're tied, you'll choose the one with the most VPs. And if you're tied, you'll choose the one closest to your world ship. And still tied, well, go random. And if that doesn't work, okay, then you'll put it on the un uninhabited planet where the AI has the least amount of units. Still tied, choose closest to your world ship. Still tied, choose randomly. Again, you know, I'm going through this fast here, but if you read, it'll work. Don't worry. And of course, if all that is unapplicable, well, then the AI gains two VP. Mm -hmm. And last but not least here is way at the end here is the scavenge. Again, I didn't do a card for this, but whenever you put your token on scavenge, uh, the AI will discard two cards from the top of the power deck. And that's pretty much it. Now, I know this seems like a lot of information to take in, but honestly, you know, you pick your action, you do the thing that you would normally do that makes the most sense for you, and then the AI just responds. So you'll just go through the checklist, do what it says, and that's it. Comes back to your turn. You pick something else, you do what you gotta do, and then you just go through the list to have the AI respond to that. It's pretty straightforward. Now, of course, the AI will make some dumb decisions. Of course he will, okay? They're all drunk on these spaceships. That's the rumor going around in the sector. Ah, that's just what I heard. I'm not saying it's true. And I firmly believe that this is an actual good way of learning the game. If you've just bought this thing and you've never played it, this is a good way to learn it. Because, again, you will be playing the normal way. Pretty much all of the situations that you would have in a normal two or three player game, you will still have those situations by playing solo against this automated thing. So, yeah, I would pretty much recommend that. Because, like, for me, the first time that I tried playing this game, I decided to control two different races. I was like, I'm gonna try to, you know, have these guys go and have these guys go. But I j it just ended up being like a like a three, four hour slog because not only did I have a lot of rules questions, you know, kept flipping and reading and all that, but then I didn't really get to optimize anything or be good at anything because I wasn't concentrating on, you know, my one race and how to make them good, right? How to get their, not their engine, but just how to manage their resources and have everything, you know, really sing and really flow. I was always changing from one to the other. I kind of got lost in all of that and with the new, and with the rules and everything. So I don't know, I feel like controlling just one 
race, and then just going through like, you know, a kind of a dumb checklist is a good way to learn a game. So there you go. That's what I have to say about that. So I'm going to end the video here, but I will actually be doing a playthrough, like a full playthrough with this mode, if you want to see some of that. And uh, hopefully I'll win. <laughs> And if I don't, well, then the video will end uh, abruptly. So thanks for watching. I hope you enjoy this. Again, uh, big props to the person who actually came up with this mode. I, I just brought in a little bit of tweaks. I made the language, I think, a little bit easier to understand. And uh, yeah, made them, you know, in a more digestible format, I think. So again, big props to the person who did that. I, that's like 98% of the work. So bing, there you go. So thank you for watching. Don't forget to click, like, subscribe, all that jazz. And I will see you guys on the next one. If you've enjoyed this video, please consider hitting the like button down below. Now, I know it seems like a very small thing to do, but it actually does help the channel when you do that. And if ever you should find yourself in a super generous mood, well, I do accept donations via PayPal. And anything you give, big or small, will help keep me going. Shoot.